Listen up, get ready, I'm not gonna take no more There's a revolution, a revelation going on in my soul Buckle up, get ready, we're not gonna sit back Good morning everybody and welcome to another edition of the Live from the Heartland show From Chicago, I'm Michael James with uh, another edition of the Live from the Heartland show This one is for the week of October 15th and we are recording it on Wednesday the 12th Okay, uh, I'm really happy to say that we have uh, a new helper, a uh, new co-producer and engineer. That would be a fellow I know real well, Hal James. And we, at the same time, want to thank Emilio Davis, who's been with us for, you know, six months, almost a year. And um, he's got another job, and we're wishing him well. Um, we like to start off with good things that happened this week, and I'm going to share once again my experience with my class. I teach a class at DePaul called Activists and Activism Since 1960. And this past week, we uh, we showed up at the DePaul campus and were met by uh, Obed, Omar, Obed Lopez, and um, I'm sorry, Omar Lopez, his brother is Obed, uh, and Omar was uh, Minister of Education or Information in the uh, Young Lords Organization. And uh, he talked a lot about uh, back in the day when the Young Lords were fighting urban renewal in Lincoln Park, uh, were actually being driven out of Lincoln Park when they took over the McCormick's Theological Seminary. Um, young Lords uh, has a new... Uh, uh, version, the new era young lords in a number of cities. And over time, I imagine we'll hear about them. But it's always good to talk with people who've been working for social change and political change here in Chicago. And Omar Lopez is one of those people. So it was really good to see him. Um, I want to call your attention to last week when uh, we had Brian Meir in Brazil talking about the Brazil elections. And that, that uh, Interview is up on youtube.com slash heartland media slash videos. If you want to see it, it was a good interview, uh, about a half hour long, and he filled us in a lot of details about the election uh, that is ongoing still in Brazil and uh, a lot of detail about uh, Lulu, who is running against Bolsonaro. Um, also last week, uh, Katie Hogan, who sometimes is a host and is a producer of the show, but is off busy getting uh, people to go to the polls and getting people to go help turn out people to go to the polls. And I'm going to just say once again, we need as many people as possible out there knocking on doors, calling people, sending postcards. And if you want to help out in the last four weeks of the uh, till the midterms, go to uh, Katie Hogan 70 at gmail.com, or you can hit me up at fatback at aol.com. All right. Um, I want to give a special shout out to uh, my daughter, Casey Blue James, who lives in New York, who runs marathons, who loves books. And she turns, uh, I don't quite know exactly her age or if I can reveal it, but her birthday is tomorrow, the 13th. So a big happy birthday to you, Casey Blue. And I'm sure you will uh, be watching this show or listening to it and know that we love you a whole lot. Um, uh, each week, I tend to go to the computer and type in something like uh, labor news for progressives. And today something popped up from the Progressive Magazine. And I took a look at Progressive Magazine. And a couple of things struck me and caught my attention. Uh, one is, and these are all articles in the progressive, but Starbucks is using the police as strike breakers. Despite the company's progressive branding, management has been quick to call in law enforcement to retaliate against workers fighting for a union. Another article in this month's progressive uh, or their online version is justice for minor league baseball players. Pauperism in the league has been a national disgrace for years. Now things may be finally changing. And there is a, what I first saw was a talk about a wildcat strike, an article, Labor Rising, uh, with uh, Amazon workers having a sit-down strike in Tilbury, Essex, England. 
Um, and after they were angry about a paltry raise offer, which is 35 pence or 47 cents an hour, uh, they uh, had a wildcat strike. So we will keep you posted. On the international front, uh, dominating the news, um, the Saudis and others uh, changing the price of oil or not producing enough oil to meet needs. Uh, so the price will be driven up. That's going on. As well as uh, we heard a lot about advances by Ukrainian forces uh, taking back seized territory that Russia had. Um, and then we heard this past week that a uh, bridge from Crimea was uh, blown up. Uh, and then most recently, the last couple of days, really sad news about uh, the number of missiles that Russia is sending into the Ukraine. And U Ukraine is asking Western forces, uh, US, England, et cetera, for more aid. Um, we usually do a sports report, but we're gonna hold off because we have our friend Dave Zyron, who knows a lot more about sports than I do. He will be with us shortly. Um, here in the ward, uh, the 49th ward, uh, we still have our farmer's market open. I'll fill you in next week when I find out the details about uh, how much longer we'll be there, as well as cultural havens, both on Jarvis and Glenview for food, music, booze. Um, and um, a little bit later, we're gonna have uh, our older woman, Maria Haddon, giving us a little tour about what's going on in the ward. Uh, take note, all you film lovers, after a two-year hiatus, the 58th Chicago International Film Festival will begin um, this week, uh, launching a program of 90 feature films and 60 shows over the next 12 days. Uh, I think that started uh, on Wednesday when we were recording, so you'll either see it on Friday night or Saturday morning on air, uh, but know that it's going on. and they. Uh, the festival has returning from a mostly in-person viewing uh, to a lot of venues, as well as uh, Chicago History Museum and two park district locations. So we're gonna take a short break and we'll be right back with Dave Zyron talking sports and politics. Uh, don't go too far, stay tuned here on the left end of your dial if you're listening on Saturday morning. Uh, otherwise uh, you can get it on YouTube and on Spotify and Google Podcast. I'm Michael James. Glad to be here with you and be right back. Okay, we're here with Live from the Heartland for the week of October 15th. And it's really an uh, honor and a pleasure to have our next guest, the one, the only Dave Zyron. And uh, Dave and I met through Dave Megacy, who used to be a pro football player and a longtime activist. Uh, we spent some time together in El Paso and Juarez with Athletes United for Peace and Basketball in the Barrio. And we used to love it when he would come visit his sister in Evanston and come to the Heartland Cafe. And we had them on this show many times. You could probably find some of them at youtube.com slash Heartland Media. So that's enough of that. Let's just get started. Good morning to you, Dave Zyron. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So you're laying up there in your hometown in uh, Washington or outside of Washington? Yeah, right outside of DC doing my thing. Uh, very excited. I've got this documentary out called Behind the Shield, the Power and Politics of the National Football League, and it's making some waves. So, I, you know, I'm excited. Well, let's oh, start. And I'm, and I'm working on a biography of Howard Zinn. So well, Howard Zinn, not Norm Chomsky. No, Howard Zinn. I, I made a mistake early on, so it's a Howard Zinn, because uh, I read some debate that was going on about uh, sports being the opiate of the masses and you defending sports. And, you know, I always... I've said many times that progressives who don't like sports are missing something, and it's uh, sports is real important. So I stand corrected. I talked about Chomsky, but it was Howard Zinn. Well, start off with telling us about that book you're working on. Well, you know, Howard Zinn was somebody who I knew uh, at the end of his life. Um, we, we did some events together where I would interview him on stage. 
Uh, he's a terrific person. And I was thinking to myself a lot, Howard passed away in 2010 at the age of 87. And I found myself thinking recently, gosh, what would Howard say about everything that ails uh, the world right now? Like, what would Howard say? And I started to think about Howard's unique brand of radical optimism and how desperately we need that today. Uh, and so that led me down a, a mental path of saying we need to talk about his whole life and give it a, a proper biographical format. Because uh, his life is just incredible from his uh, years as a dock worker organizer in the 30s to his time as a bombardier in World War II to a frontline activist in the black freedom struggle as well as uh, in the anti-war movement and onward to write a people's history and be so involved into his 80s. I mean, there's a great story there. And I think when you think about all the people who read People's History of the United States, and it's at something like 4 million copies sold, that doesn't even count the ones that have been lent out to friends and family. I know I've done that more than a few times. Uh, it creates an opportunity uh, to say, okay, you know, you love this book, uh, you treasure this book, learn something about the person who wrote it. So I guess what I'm saying is I'm trying to write a People's History of Howard Zinn. Well, that's nice. Uh, I'm going to look forward to that. But so what was the because you knew him, what was the shift from you writing about sports figures in politics, whether it be Muhammad Ali or Kaepernick or Jim Brown, et cetera, to uh, a biography about a, a radical professor? Well, all I've done is write about sports and politics. It's been 20 years now, if you can believe it. So I thought I, I, I'd earned the right to try something new. Uh, I found myself just thinking about Howard a lot and thinking about our world uh, and trying to think about how I could make a contribution and writing about Howard seemed like a, a good place to start. Well, that'll be good. And uh, did Howard Zinn like sports? Oh, yeah. He was a big baseball fan above all else. Um, a Red Sox fan, which is kind of upsetting given that he was born in Brooklyn. But yeah, that's I was I, I was at Eppins Field in the late 40s. There you go. I mean, but uh, Howard, his affection for the Red Sox grew organically from his years teaching at Boston University. Uh, so he, he was a fan. Uh, and um, we went to a panel together with the legendary pitcher uh, Jim Bouton, the author of Ball Four, uh, one of the great exposés of what life is actually like on a major league baseball team. So that was a lot of fun. Um, and it sort of revealed to Howard that, you know, that sports are really an important part of social history. So then he brought me in to write the book, um, A People's History of Sports in the United States, which is a part of the People's History series. Well, I got to say that when I'm talking to people who like the Red Sox, I never forget to point out that they were the last team to take an African-American player only uh, and the Yankees were second to last. Uh, I grew up on the Brooklyn Dodgers. Now I'm a solid White Sox fan, but oh, sorry. we didn't have too good an ending this year. No. OK, you're listening to Live from the Heartland. You may be watching it. We're talking with our friend Zave Zyron. We're talking sports and politics. And Dave, uh, in thinking about getting together with you this morning, I, I, I thought of a great topic, sex and sports. And uh, we had a report last week uh, really about uh, sexual harassment by coaches, et cetera, in women's soccer. And then in the news, I saw most recently that uh, the Canadian hockey officials in the NHL had a secret fund to pay off uh, uh, people who were suing around sexual misconduct and sexual harassment. Uh, any take on these two things? Well, I mean, one thing for sure is that what's being revealed, you know, really as, as part of the afterburners of the Me Too movement is something that's been pernicious in women's sports for far too long. And the more we can shine a light on this world, I mean, I, I think we can extinguish or at least largely extinguish um, all the predation that exists. Uh, so, so that's the hope here, that the light can be the best disinfectant and we can, in effect, break the wheel because this wheel has been turning for a long time, but it takes tremendous social effort 
in any endeavor to break wheels, break cycles, uh, break what seems like it'll never end. But it looks like because of the bravery of a lot of these women, they, they have a chance of doing that. Yeah, there's a uh, certainly there's a lot of uh, the issue comes up a whole lot uh, with pro football players, college football players, now hockey players. Um, and, you know, at a time when women's sports has been on the ascendancy with Title IX, it's pretty tragic that we have uh, a lot of guys still misbehaving. Well, that's the thing. And this is the 50th anniversary of Title IX as well. Uh, this past year. And I don't know if you noticed this in the coverage, but it was less kind of this joyous celebration uh, than more this kind of fear uh, that what's been won in the past is no longer with us. I mean, to have it happen right after uh, the Roe versus Wade was, was destroyed. I mean, this has not been a, a year where women and and people who you know, believe in women's rights could feel secure that those rights were going to maintain themselves. Uh, so to have Title IX in that context, it just did feel less celebratory and more, wow, this, this you know, this disgusting uh, Supreme Court, this Christo-fascist Supreme Court is going to take away, um, you know, Title IX as well. Like, so a lot of the discussions that I heard were more about how do we defend this than it's time to celebrate. So this is a very precarious position right now for women in sports where there's a great deal of empowerment, but also now where threats exist uh, around every corner. Uh, Dave, at the outset of this talk, uh, you uh, mentioned that you have a documentary film out. Uh, and I didn't know that. I knew about you working on a new book, even though I had the, uh, the subject wrong. Um, tell us a little bit about the film you're working on. Give oh, us the details. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. It's called Behind the Shield, The Power and Politics of the National Football League. And we're offering it for free at BehindTheShieldMovie.com for the next couple weeks. So if you go to BehindTheShieldMovie.com, you can see a 90-minute documentary absolutely skewering the National Football League on more fronts than I could possibly mention. But suffice it to say, in there is militarism, racism, sexism, masculinity and how it's formed. We take on everything. And people, whether you're a fan of the NFL or whether you can't stand the NFL, uh, this is really a film that I think people need to see. How did you end up getting involved with that? How did that come to be that you were doing a film rather than writing books? Well, I mean, I, I was interested in playing around with different mediums to get the message out. Uh, different media, I should say, to get the message out. And there's an organization called the Media Education Foundation. And they reached out to me and said, you know, we'd be interested in putting something together about the NFL. And honestly, I jumped at the opportunity because I'm a big movie guy myself. And I just love the idea of uh, of, of trying out different ways to get the message out. Because it really is about the message at the end of the day. Well, you've been good at getting the message out. And uh, tell us a little bit about the kind of uh, things you're doing. I mean, uh, you've got some talk shows sometime. You're on um, being a commentator, even on mainstream news sometimes. Give us a little bit of uh, what you have your fingers into these days on that front. Oh, gosh. I mean... Definitely uh, looking at trying to push this movie outward, definitely trying to interview as many people who are contemporaries of Howard Zinn as possible. Uh, and, and, and that's really been my focus. I mean, I just signed to do the Zinn book, got a couple years to do it. And uh, in November, I'm going to be on Bob Costas's HBO show to talk about, uh, among other things, the film. So. That, 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 that's exciting. Uh, when we first uh, came to know each other, it was through our friend David Megacy, who played for the St. Louis Cardinals, wrote a wonderful sports book uh, called Out of Their League. It's uh, Sports Illustrated has long called it one of the 100 best sports books ever. And uh, that, was the, that was the link. And then uh, you asked me to write a little blurb for the front of one of your books. I think it yeah. was uh, What's, What's My, my Name, Fool? 
And uh, I was honored to do that. Uh, but thinking about Megacy, uh, all the way on up to Kaepernick, we always were looking for progressive sports people. And uh, you uh, did stuff with John Carlos and Tommy Smith. You've met a lot of people. I'm just curious to know your thoughts. One about, uh, I'd like to know your take on the Kaepernick, and it, it doesn't look like he's coming back to play, but are there any other, I'm sure there are plenty, but what do you know about progressive sports figures these days? Who's out there that we kind of can root for? Well, Jalen Brown, who it's tough for me to root for because he plays for uh, <laughs> the Boston Celtics, but he really has a lot going on. And just I, I, every time he opens his mouth, it's a good thing. Um, some of the other folks I think people need to look at are, uh, you know, it's interesting. Like I think uh, Simone Biles isn't done being a, being someone who speaks out and that's very important. Um, but I think the most important thing people have to realize is that this is a, a difficult time in terms of struggle and social movements. And it's really only out of the movements that these activists arise. They don't arise in a vacuum. So keep your eye on the movements, keep your eye on building the movements. And that's where we're going to find ourselves uh, in a much better place. Well, Dave, I wanted to ask you about Joe Burrow of the Bengals. And the reason I'm doing that is because uh, I, when I'm watching other games, you know, I'm kind of curious about where people are at. So I did look him up and he made some uh, criticisms of the former president, the last president. And I'm just wondering what you know about Joe Burrow. Uh, Ohio guy like Megacy. Uh, and, you know, not only is he a good football player, I'm hoping he's a person that will carry on and move things in a progressive direction. Am I on target or not? Well, he had a lot of courage in uh, coming out for um, uh, abortion rights as well after Hobbs. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah. And he spoke out even on his draft day about wanting to do something about poverty in Ohio. So I would actually feel very hopeful about Joe Burrow and what he could mean going forward, particularly as a white athlete, particularly as a quarterback. There's just a lot there. Let's take a little tour around the sports and see if you have anything to talk. What do you got to say about National Hockey League starting up the season? Uh, not too much. Um, well, not, a big, <laughs> not a big hockey guy, but I'm very excited to have the league start right now because it means basketball is right around the corner. Well, I watched the Bulls uh, win again last night. Uh, what's your take on basketball? What should people be looking for? Who are you rooting for, et cetera, et cetera? I'll definitely check out the Golden State Warriors and see if they could survive the fact that uh, there was just a high-profile fight between two of the people on the team. Uh, so keep a close eye on them because they're the defending champions. Uh, you always want to keep an eye on the Lakers and LeBron James, and if this year, unlike last year, they can fit in uh, Russell Westbrook into what it is they're trying to do. Uh, so I would, I would put those two things at the top. Um, Any take on the Bulls? And uh, I don't think, I don't see the Bulls doing too much, but watch my Washington Wizards. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the big sports and the one that I've known and loved the longest is baseball. And uh, last sure. night, which would have been Tuesday the 11th, there were four games on it. Plus, uh, what else did I watch? Also, there was a Bulls game. So there were four games going on. We're in the middle of the playoffs. Who do you like? Uh, who are some players in leagues that you uh, call, want to call attention to? And your take on those playoff games? Well, I mean, obviously, the big story is uh, what happened uh, yesterday with the Seattle Mariners losing on a three-run home run. Uh, in the bottom of the ninth uh, with two outs. And that had and just an amazing, amazing moment by Jordan Alvarez. And you, this hasn't happened since the famous Kirk Gibson home run uh, for the Dodgers against the Oakland A's in the World Series and Dennis Eckersley. I mean, that's the only other time there's been a come-from-behind home run to win a playoff or, of course, World Series game. So that's exciting. And I'm certainly into that and in seeing where Houston goes from here. Uh, and, you know, other than that, I mean, 
you know, I was a huge Baltimore Orioles fan all year. Uh, so, you know, seeing that part of the season end is a little sad when your team doesn't make the playoffs. Uh, but I'm excited to see what the Seattle Mariners can do and if they can come back from such a devastating loss to the Houston Astros, who I think need to be seen as a World Series favorite. Uh, do you any anything that I didn't ask you that you'd like to share? Anything you'd like to ramble on about a little bit? <laughs> no, thanks. I got to get back to work. But Okay, then I'll ask you one more. Since we mentioned him a few times, let's give a little uh, talk about Dave Megacy and the legacy that he has laid the groundwork for. Megacy legacy. Well, uh, Dave is in my movie. We have a lot of scenes with Dave that we found some old footage from back in the day. Because the movie isn't just decrying the National Football League, it's telling the history of rebel athletes. And you can't tell the story of rebel athletes without telling the story of Dave Megacy. I mean, somebody who left his sport uh, in his prime because he opposed the way that the NFL, he felt, was building support for the war in Vietnam, uh, both literally and figuratively, through the war games that we play on the field. And then he wrote a book about it called Out of Their League, which was really groundbreaking, as you mentioned before. Uh, he became a labor activist after that. And, you know, Dave Megacy is one of the people who makes you feel uh, proud to be a part of this sports and politics world because he's he's as good as they come. Uh, Dave Zyron, it's always a pleasure to talk with you. Uh, I miss seeing you in person, but I imagine that'll happen again soon or later. Yeah, and uh, you here. keep up the good work because the world appreciates all the good work that you've been doing. Well, thank you so much, Mike James. You be well. All right, brother. Talk to you. All man. right, everybody who's been tuning in and listening or watching, we are going to take a short break and we will be right back uh, with the Alder Woman of the 49th Ward here in Chicago, the incomparable, another incomparable, Maria Haddon. Be right back. Don't go too far. Stay here on the left end of your dial. Hey, we're back. We're back with more live from the heartland. And, uh, you know, this show originates uh, out of the 49th Ward. Used to come to you uh, every Saturday live from the Heartland Cafe. Now we do it via Zoom. And uh, a number of times we've had uh, Maria Haddon on the show, and we're glad to have her again because she's our older woman and we really love her. And uh, so I've asked her to come on to give us a little walking tour around the beautiful, wonderful mighty 49th ward uh we've had a lot of things going on from homeless encampments to indigenous people's day uh venezuelans coming from far south to hang out at leon beach now fill us in maria and good morning to you yeah good morning and happy to happy to be uh back um i'm live from the heartland uh always a pleasure to be here um so things have been things have been uh always interesting here in the 49th ward um, and um, try, try as I take you on this virtual walk um, yeah. through the 49th Ward, we're also going to be traveling a bit through time and space, um, right? So we're going to cover maybe a, a few things from, from the end of the summer. Um, so I'll say one of the things really notable to me about, um, you know, the, the, as, we, as we find our new normal through the pandemic, um, things were really back, um, back in full force. Um, sign of the summer and fall. So from our summer festivals, the Glenwood Avenue Arts Fest, um, just great attendance and turnout at our events to um, back to school, really going off without a hitch and having a lot of a um, lot more hope in some of our back to school things. Um, for the first time ever, we had a full kind of uh, the full CPS back to school bash in Rogers Park, which was great. So they yeah, was. do these in other other parts of the city. It was our first time getting it here in Rogers Park, and um, uh, it was wonderful just to be there with the kids and the families and, and all the, the staff. Um, and back to school has been going great, which is a good sign for some of our, you know, kind of what's our new normal, right? Uh, what's the health of our community looking like? Um, of course, as we enter the, the fall, um, we just had a flu and vaccine clinic, right? Get your COVID booster, get your flu vaccine. Um, still kind of focusing on making sure people stay healthy 
and um, also say that, you know, we're entering this Halloween season. So there's a lot of upcoming Halloween events. So I'll say for all community events, I'll just put a plug in for the weekly newsletter. Um, so whether you're looking for, um, I think, um, what is it? Um, Mrs. Holmes is playing at the Lifeline Theater, right? We've got shows at Theater Above the Law, whether you're looking for theater events or, you know, specials at the different bars. There were a couple Oktoberfest celebrations that we had. Um, over this month, both at the Jarvis and Glenwood Alfresco spaces uh, put on by community businesses um, or even, you know, the scary movies over at the New 400. There's a, a lot of things to do. So our our weekly ward newsletter, um, you can sign up at 49thward.org. Um, the newsletter comes out every Friday or Saturday, depending on how busy I am. Uh, and it comes out in English and Spanish. So I'll say, you know, check out community events there. Um, as far as some of the, the big significant happenings um, and what's been on people's minds here in the 49th Ward, we did just celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day on Monday. Um, so I'm a co-sponsor on legislation in city council looking to um, remove Columbus Day as a holiday that we celebrate and replace it with Indigenous Peoples Day. Um, so this is something that's just long overdue. Um, you know, Christopher Columbus um, is not someone who should be lifted up and have his own day. Um, and we've got a statewide coalition of the Indigenous Peoples Day um, uh, holiday who've been working on this effort at the state, county and city level for many years now. So I'm proud to be a supporter. And we had the second year in a row where they did an Indigenous Peoples Day celebration right here in the 49th Ward at Pottawatomie Park. Um, so, Michael, you were there. You got some great photos. I did. And let me just say that it's kind of symbolic that this is right there on what used to be the border. Mm -hmm. or between the city and I guess the, Indian, the Indian boundary line. Yes. Indian, yeah. So yeah, Rogers Avenue um, is uh, was known as the Indian boundary line. We actually have a commemorative plaque that's right next to the Rogers Park Fruit Market. Um, that was part of a, an intensive review during the Chicago Monuments Project. Um, right. So this big, you know, committee the mayor put together to review monuments um, that might be problematic, historically inaccurate. Um, or not tell the full story. And a shout out to the Rogers Park Westridge Historical Society on helping our community um, bring in historians and, and local experts to really educate and inform us um, about this monument, this plaque, and to make recommendations to the committee on how we could um, share a broader perspective, especially a perspective from that of the indigenous people um, that used to live here and that currently live here today. So you can check that information out on the Chicago Monuments Project. Um, but so it was a great celebration on Monday as we move forward on those legislative efforts. Um, I'll say that, you know, some other things that we've been in the news for lately um, over at Leon Beach Park Fieldhouse uh, a couple weeks ago, we received um, for temporary shelter about 50 to 60 of the arriving migrants that, uh, you know, they've been Abbott's been shipping people from Texas and in pretty relentless waves, right? With no concern for their health or safety, um, you know, using people as pawns in these um, political, political debates he's been doing. But here in Chicago, the city and our partner agencies, the county and the state have really gone above and beyond to make sure people have kind of safe temporary space um, in order to kind of get, get their bearings, um, you know, get safe, uh, get some health checks, and so here in Rogers Park, we're now home to one of the temporary shelters. Let me uh, jump in and ask you, we, uh, we also got some uh, folks coming from Afghanistan, uh, you know, a couple of years ago now, I guess. Yes. Uh, we've always been a welcoming place, whether it was the Somalia, various things, you know, there's a lot of different kind of people here in Rogers Park and it keeps that's happening. That's true, right? Um, our uh, affordable housing, our access to transportation, and so much of our culture, right, of, of just, you know, whether it's, you know, um, immigrants and refugees who've resettled here, um, interracial, right, couples and families, um, the LGBTQ community are people of a variety of different religious practices and faiths, right? This is a, a community um, that's got everybody um, and really accepts everyone. And so I know that's one of the things that I felt when I first moved here um, and why I made this my home. And so it's um, great to see that culture kind of continue. And so um, happy to work with the city and the park district, right? 
and our local uh, government partners in order to, to make this a possibility as we work to help people find more permanent shelter in situations. Uh, but we're probably, um, this is coming up in the budget, you'll hear a lot of talks about this as we're working on the city budget as well, of what kind of financial, um, you know, kind of costs do we need to prepare for in 2023? Like, are we gonna see more of this continue? Um, more of these shenanigans from, from Texas and, and Florida. Um, so, you know, TBD there. Yeah. Uh, Maria, uh, do you wanna give us a little bit more of any other things on the walking tour? Yeah, so I'll say um, uh, a few things. Uh, we had, we've had some really big community meetings lately. Um, we had one a couple weeks ago as well about the homeless encampment at Tui Park. So I know this has been, we've had a few articles about it. It's on a lot of people's minds. Um, you know, earlier this year, we had a robust community process to consider uh, approval of a special use permit for the location of a new um, emergency men's shelter um, at Clark Street in Birchwood, um, which I approved and had over 70% support from our community. Um, and these are two two pieces here, right? The The situation of, people experiencing homelessness living in Tui Park and, you know, the actions that we're trying to take in order to meet the needs of a growing population of people experiencing homelessness. We're seeing it all over the city, um, working with the park district, working with the city um, has been challenging in some respects, but right now, um, if you don't want to watch the Zoom of that three-hour meeting, I'll, I'll cut to the action steps. Let me just um, say, I thought you were very measured. I mean, I didn't watch it all. I had it tuned on, but I was watching some <laughs> sports game. Um, but I, I thought you really, uh, you, you're very kind and nice and pretty mellow. You dealt with, uh, you know, there were a lot of people who really understood homelessness. There were also people who just expected, why don't the police just kick them out? Um, yeah. And you, you 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 took it all in stride and I thought you were great. Well, thanks, thanks, Michael. Well, and it's, um, I'll say some people, um, some people think of it as uh, um, being nice or being extra patient. And <laughs> some of it is that, but I actually just think it's really important for us to model and for leaders to model um, democratic spaces that are productive, right? Like, <laughs> I'm an elect I'm an elected representative, so I'm supposed to listen to the constituents that I serve. Um, and also, we need to be functional as communities, right? Whether it be uh, neighborhoods or wards or districts or counties, um, so much of what we need in order to have a healthy functioning democracy are spaces where we can have difficult discussions where people can have different experiences and different opinions, but where we can, bring it all together and actually find solutions. And so, you know, we're gonna have another accelerated housing event for the residents, you know, who are living in the park um, and folks in our area. We are working with DFSS to try and find this, this housing as quickly as possible for people before it gets too cold. Um, we did this really successfully last year. We had two of those events and housed 64 people. Um, so between November and March, so looking to do that again this year and then really working with the park district in the city to come up with a plan for how we're going to make sure that that park is open for its programs um, and recreation um, needs for the community, especially the school across the street as we move into 2023. Um, yeah. Is that it for the walking tour? Um, last thing I want to mention, because I'm going to plug again, this is in the, the, the newsletter. Um, but um, we also, on September 11th, we experienced a really big storm, right? Yeah. Um, uh, almost every, there was a very few, there was maybe like two or three blocks of the entire 49th Ward that was unaffected by the flooding, right? So um, the, the September 11th storm event, that supercell storm, um, saw uh, just a ton of water in a short period of time. So just want to let people know that the water department does have an upcoming meeting um, and I'm going to have to uh, actually find the newsletter to, to plug the date here. Um, so thank you to everybody. On. It's getting dark out here. Oh, you are getting, yeah, the rain's coming again, right? But um, we um, thank you for everyone who reported through the city or through my office um, what was happening with um, any flooding that you experienced. Uh, because we're using this to um, inform our planning. 
So on Tuesday, October 18th, Tuesday, October, sorry guys, on Tuesday, October 18th from 6 to 7 p.m., um, the Department of Water Management, right, um, and the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District are having a big community event um, to talk about, um, you know, what's happening with the city and in, in MWRD sewer systems um, to really help people understand kind of um, what happened on the 11th and how we're preparing for future events. Um, and then last but not least, how could I not mention Rogers Park was voted, uh, we were in the top five best neighborhoods to live in in the entire country. Um, and uh, how did I that have happen? To, I, I, I have to that. say, I have to say, I, um, I can't disagree. No, we got it all. We got great transportation. We've got a real diverse community. We got, and we got the lake, which really, got uh, the lake. and some nice parks. Yeah. Okay. Well, this was good so far. Let's, uh, let's go to the midterms because the midterms across the country are really crucial to the future of democracy. Um, I, I'm amazed that they even talk about people voting for the Republicans or the grand old party, as it's called, the GOP. And, um, you know, it's just, it's like so blatant and so evil in a lot of ways uh, mm -hmm. around race, around gender, et cetera, et cetera, the environment. What's your, uh, your thoughts about the midterms and what your thoughts are about what people who are of concern or are concerned can do in the next four weeks before the election? Um, I am... Uh, I think like a lot of folks, maybe a little anxious about the midterms and kind of what the impact is going to be for the country overall. Um, here in Illinois, um, excited to to support Pritzker for another term. And, you know, he's getting some of those endorsements. He got that Tribune uh, editorial board in, endorsement, oh, did, I think, huh? this week. Yeah, they did, <laughs> even though he wouldn't sit with them. He apparently, he said he was tired of always being dragged by them and he wasn't going to sit with them. <laughs> Um, but they made the endorsement just, um, you know, lauding the the good work that he's done over these last four years. Um, he and his team and really bringing Illinois stability and, and wellness through through turbulent times and finding that his uh, his opponent is just way too extreme. Right. Um, but we've got some important Supreme Court races. Um, I really encourage folks to check out if you're not familiar with some of the judicial things or the Illinois Supreme Court, um, check out Injustice Watch. They're a great space to, to look at some judicial uh, recommendations and to see what's on your ballot. Do your research. Um, we've also got, um, uh, I believe, um, um, workers' rights amendments um, coming up for us as well. Right. So um, the uh, Amendment 1. Um, as it's known. And so we're looking to make sure that we can have um, strong supported workers' rights all around our state. I think right now we're seeing um, just uh, huge issues and um, some where we'd had some progress and kind of uh, wages going up. Um, we've really are kind of see that starting to stagnate. And of course, over these last couple of years, um, we've run into a lot of issues of of workers' rights being violated throughout the pandemic. Um, and so check out um, Amendment 1, it's our workers' rights amendment. I'd ask people to check that out as well. It would amend Article 1 of our state's constitution. Um, and um, we need 60% approval in order to pass this to amend our constitution. So we wanna make sure that we're embedding workers' rights um, in our state constitution. So. There are some big opportunities to make sure that we're setting the stage and setting our values in Illinois um, in an important way as we see some of our neighboring states really kind of going the other direction, right, and reproductive health rights and workers' rights. Um, we need to make sure that we are holding steady, um, protecting our values and protecting our rights here in Illinois. And that's why the midterm is going to be important for us locally. So encourage people to get out and vote early. Uh, make sure your neighbors get out and uh, look for opportunities to help get out the vote um, in your area. Uh, that's good. And uh, once those elections are over, we are looking forward to another election. Uh, oh, yes, this is, this is the, the, the election municipal, cycle. Yeah, municipal oh, no. elections. Uh, <laughs> I think it's for the whole county, is it, uh, in February? Um, no, nope, February is the city. Just city. the city, okay. Yep, just so the city. So what's going on in that race? We got the mayoral race, we've got 
Uh, you're running again. You do have some mm -hmm. opposition. Um, talk, talk a little bit about that, and then we'll finish up with uh, how you see the next city council, because a number of people are resigning, sure. and a lot of new eager people are coming on the scene. Yeah. Um, so high level view, the February 28th election, um, what people need to know is that you'll get to vote for your older person, you'll get to vote for mayor, for city clerk, for city treasurer. Um, you're also going to get to vote for um, first, first time ever, brand new elected positions, right, on our community um, police oversight commission, right? So this uh, community commission um, we get to elect three um, people from each of our police districts. So here in the 49th Ward, we're located in the 24th Police District. Um, but you're going to see, um, if you live in the 49th Ward, you'll get to vote for three people who will be your um, elected representatives um, to work on this commission, engage both with community members and the local police district on trying to figure out ways to improve services, right? Um, and make sure that you have a voice. And so this is going to be brand new. So February 28th, you're going to have a lot to vote for. Um, I'm running for re-election. This will be uh, going for the second term. I'm excited about it because um, I figure it's got to be easier than the first term. I'm like, we can't have another global pandemic, right? I don't think we're <laughs> going to get another tornado. I'm hoping that we don't have three beaches wash away into the lake from lakefront <laughs> erosion. And perhaps that once in a 60-year flood situation, will stay to the 60 year flood situation. So that's what I'm hoping for, um, Michael, in the next four years is fewer crises. Um, but that would be great. I've done, I mean, done, done a lot of crisis, job, for, done a lot of crisis response. Um, people ask, hey, is the job what you thought it would be? Or what are the things that are unexpected? And so much of it is what I anticipated, but the crises have been unique. So um, I'm looking forward to continuing to work on some of like our core issues, right? Um, so how we're navigating, you know, development in our community without encouraging displacement, um, how we're kind of redefining community health and safety, um, continuing to build up our local economy and, of course, supporting our public schools. So these were the priorities going into it. Um, they're the same now. Um, and you mentioned some challengers. We're getting challengers from the right. So that also was not to be uh, not a big surprise. Are they actually, um, uh, would they be Republicans or uh, further right? Or are they just I, I don't. I don't know. I don't know how they define themselves. <laughs> um, you know, our aldermanic races are nonpartisan, right? And yeah. so we don't run under a party banner, um, which in some ways I really like because it, it lets people kind of stand out on the issues without necessarily having to label themselves under, under a party, um, which is someone who is a reluctant Democrat sometimes and, 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 you know, sometimes Me feels too. like we're not further <laughs> left enough. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I appreciate that. So, but as far as the issues coming from these challengers, there's a lot of focus on, you know, crime being up it's, it's up everywhere. And it's something that's been challenging, right. Um, that we really, um, have been working to address, um, as we're going through a pretty, a pretty defining change in our city, our relationship with policing, but also, how we all have been making more investments in broader public safety solutions, um, things that help to address root causes of violence and crime. Um, so some growing pains there, but I think we're doing well and headed in the right direction as a city. Um, a lot of folks, um, you know, uh, don't have solid platforms. They just, you know, I'm, I think I've been labeled as, um, a big hearted person with good intentions and no actions. Um, but I will say that um, both here at home from investments, I think we got like 25 million investments in Sullivan. Um, you know, we've gotten special programs at our school the first time in 30 years in Rogers Park. Um, the way we were able to set up um, community response team in the pandemic and, and the legislative actions that I have in supporting our seniors and you know, pushing for our Department of Environment, our fossil fuel divestments. We've got a long list of accomplishments in, in a pretty short time period. So I'm looking forward to serving another term, um, to carrying that work forward and continuing to represent the best uh, the best ward in the city. Ah, uh, that's good. And uh, let me ask you, a number of people, uh, including our neighbor, Harry Osterman to the south in the 48th, and there's a bunch more, a number of people uh, are not running, rerunning. So what is your sense of the candidates around the city and the future city council? Um, I'm looking forward to a bunch of new colleagues. Um, I think 
what we've seen through through this term, right? So for those of us elected in 2019, our term is enough until May of 2023. So while we're about to go for re-elections, you know, we're really just kind of a little over three, three and a half years um, into our terms. And we saw a lot of, I have a lot of great colleagues that joined with me, um, newer ideas, um, uh, folks who might come from different backgrounds and experience, um, more diversity and experience, background, professional, race, class, gender, sexual identity. Um, but also we're trying to do things a little differently in Chicago City Council. And we've got a much more independent one. So I, um, my prediction is this next election cycle is going to see us moving more in that direction. Um, so folks who aren't coming from a political dynasty, they're not necessarily, you know, <laughs> backed by a machine. Um, they're just kind of a regular old person who thought this would be a good idea, build some community support um, and does their best to be um, not just an older person who, who takes care of the rats and fills the potholes, but a legislator and a leader in an independent body that helps to balance out, um, you know, whoever the mayor is. And a lot of that concentrated control that I think has led to Chicago being further behind than we should be. Um, on many progressive issues. Uh, you mentioned the mayor. Any, any take on uh, who's running and uh, anything you want to say about the mayoral race coming up in February? <laughs> um, uh, good luck to all of us. I guess we'll see. Um, <laughs> this is an interesting mayoral race in that I feel like um, there's a lot of people running who, are they running? Are they not running? Who's going to yeah. end up on the ballot? Um, I feel like there's been a lot of talk um, going into this election cycle, but not a lot of definition. Um, so I, as a, as a voter, um, am looking for some real definition of the field so that we can really start evaluating options, because that's what it comes down to, right? Um, when, we're, when we're voting in February, um, it's ultimately going to be who's on the ballot, um, what's their platform, and who do we think are going to be the best leaders? Um, right, to kind of carry us forward. So I'm um, eager to see um, more of a clarification, right, of, you know, who's running and what's happening. Uh, Maria, this has been great. I'm going to fire one more question at you. You talked about uh, some people saying good intentions, not enough action. One of the things you took action on was uh, people drowning off our beautiful beaches. Mm -hmm. And uh, why don't you tell our listeners and our viewers about that, and then we'll let you go. Absolutely. Um, and thanks, Michael. Um, so we have flotation devices up and down the lakefront um, at all of our parks and beaches. And that um, may not sound like uh, groundbreaking news to most people who would assume, hey, we're on one of the largest natural bodies of water, surely, right? And we have 26 miles of, of beach and parkland as one of our biggest attractions. And millions of people who visit them every year, surely we would have had flotation devices, but up until this year, we didn't. Um, here at our beach where so many families and young people go because it's a safe kind of quiet area, we've seen way too many drownings. And um, the last drowning we had was Miguel Cervantes um, and um, his family um, who survived him, advocates who've been working, um, Hallie Cazada, Jim Jindersky, um, Dave Benjamin, advocates who've been working with us for years to get these flotation devices. We finally had a big victory this year. And it was so gratifying to have multiple instances this summer of those flotation devices saving lives already. Maria Haddon, I'm so glad that you uh, were willing to spend a little time with me and all <laughs> the people who view or listen to the live from the Heartland show. And it's been great to uh, be bumping into you in the neighborhood. And I look forward to having you on pretty soon again, because there'll be a lot awesome. of things to talk about. So much to talk about. Thank you, Mike. All right. Have a great day. And keep lifting those weights. Yes. <laughs> All right. You are listening to the Live from the Heartland Show. I'm Michael James. I've been your host for this uh, edition of the show. And um, we will be back next week with another edition. And uh, I'm not sure who we have on yet, but I know they'll be good. So... Thanks to all the people who make the show possible. Thanks to the guests who came on, uh, Maria Haddon today and Dave Zirin. I want to thank Josie Stoller over at WLUW at Loyola, the program director there, Katie Hogan, of course, Lynn Orman Weiss, Tom Clark, Emilio Davis, who's been our engineer, and the new guy on the scene, 
I'm uh, the one and only Hal Coltrane, Katie and James, one of my kids. Okay, keep doing good in the world. The world needs all the good that you do, that I do, that Maria does, that we all do. All power to the people. See you next week. Do you comb the sky, wondering why you've been oh so blessed? Do you take it as a sign, everything is fine and nothing less? Are you doing? Are you doing the best you can? Mm-hmm. Tell me, are you doing? Doing? Are you doing the best you can? When you're all alone down at home Like a no-bo out of tune Do you keep on blowing Knowing you're gonna get it right soon And if at the end of the day You got it going your way Everything is right on track Do you thank the Lord and rest assured Ain't no turning back Are you doing Are you doing the best you can Tell me, are you doing, doing, are you doing the best you can? Mm-hmm. Over the mountain, under the big blue sky, you got a dream awaiting. I can see it in your eye. It may not come easy, but you know you've got a friend. I'll be by your side the entire ride. Just let me hear you say amen. Are you doing, doing, are you doing the best you can? Mm-hmm. Tell me, are you doing, doing, are you doing the best you can? Le meilleur de toi-même, parce que tu l'aimes. Tu donnes, est-ce que tu donnes? Le meilleur de toi-même, si tu l'aimes. Tu donnes, est-ce que tu donnes? Le meilleur de toi-même, quand tu l'aimes. Are you doing the best you can? Tell me, are you doing?